I don't know about you guys, I walked out of my door this morning and saw the blue sky. And it like kind of rocked me back on my heels a little bit, actually. I hadn't realized how long it had been since I saw blue in the sky. Uh, it's good to, it was good to be there. Almost didn't come to church. I was all like, oh, maybe I'm just going to go hang out outside. But here we are. Glad we're here. Thank you for being here. We have time now as a church where we set aside this part of our assembling, this part of our time together, this part of our mornings for worshiping the Lord through studying his word. And uh, we've, we've arrived. It's been kind of a long journey, but we finally arrived to the last, hold your cheers, we've arrived to the last Sunday of our Love Vermont series. So um, we're going to be, yeah, thank you. That's the appropriate response. Thank you. Um, We've been spending quite a lot of time in this series, and if you remember way back, it started by looking at the parable of the sower and the way that God's truth finds its way into our innermost being, that if we allow it to take root, it grows up and bears fruit in our lives and changes us, kind of from the inside out. That's the way the Lord works in our hearts. It's been a journey of doing that, and then finally, here we are at the end, where we're looking at, at, we've been looking at several individuals and allowing them to inspire us, showing us the way that God's love changes us to be better uh, neighbors, to be better Vermonters, to, to love, for our, love our neighbors better. So here we are in this last section of this series. Our scripture this week is out of 1 Samuel, and you see that in your bulletin. We're going to read that in a second. But I just kind of want to set the stage for you before we read it to try to get us all kind of up to speed in the same, kind of thinking in the same direction. And so I felt like a little bit of an introduction about this passage is worth, worth our time. I want to share just a little bit of an illustration, and it's about going to college. I was lucky enough to go to college, and I was really, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. I enjoyed it a lot. I was looking forward to it, going to see new people, going to see a new place, doing the whole thing. I was looking forward to the whole process. I actually went to uh, college in Maine, um, on the coast of Maine. I spent a year there, my freshman year, and it was a small school out there. I was really excited to go, you know, experience something different, meet new people. It was a small, I mean like a small place, a couple hundred students. So it was very, very small. You, you basically could know everybody who was there. And it did not take long before I realized I wasn't going to fit in at this place. And the first thing is like, I'm from New Mexico, and so people... Uh, in Maine, we're kind of weirded out by that. And it is kind of weird. Um, but second of all, as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, and at this school in particular, that was pretty unusual. You know, I was definitely in the minority there. Uh, I didn't know any other students who were following Jesus. And so that was kind of just like I could tell, okay, things are a little bit different here. Th this is going to be a different kind of culture. But um, the biggest tension and I'm genuinely not exaggerating about this, the, the, the biggest thing that made me realize, like, this probably is not going to be a long-term place for me, um, the thing that created the most division between me and the other students at this school was that I ate meat. <laughs> like, I, I, I ate meat. Uh, and, like, like, it took my roommate a long time to get over this. <laughs> um, I, I, like, I wish I would, like, it's almost, it's, actually, it was funny at the time. I'm not exaggerating. The cafeteria had non-vegan day. Let that sentence sink in for a second. Like there was one day in the semester that it was not vegan at the cafeteria. That's how extreme this place was in that direction, okay? Which is fine. Like I have no judgment about that, right? But I could just tell we're, we don't see eye to eye in these lifestyle choices. Um, I was a fish out of water. Safest place in the world to be a fish because no one's going to eat it. It was, but it was hard, right? Nobody shared my interest. People didn't share my taste. And it's a funny story. It was funny at the time, even. Like, I'd go out. I'm not, this is like, I wish I was making this up, but I'd go out to get a burger by myself. And I'd be like, I got to make sure I don't smell like French fries when I get back because I don't know where I was. I was an outlier. And, uh, like, my priorities, the way I saw the world is different. And I bring that up because in some ways I feel like if you're a follower of Jesus in Vermont, you get a little bit of that. Okay. It's just like, it's just a little bit, just like, I kind of feel like my priorities and the way that I try to live my life is just a little bit out of sync with, with quite a lot of people in this state. Um, and, you know, we could, get, we could go down all kinds of different roads here, but you think about 
just the general way that this that that Vermont approaches like social issues. Um, you think about the politics here in this state. You think about some of the things that are going on in our schools, and and so many of those things, as you look at them, they don't really honor the way of Jesus. And of course, that's not. By the way, it's not just Vermont, <laughs> um, but it does feel like it might have progressed here a little bit further than some other places. And it's easy when you're in a place like this to begin to feel as a Christian as kind of an outsider, to begin to feel like, like I'm not sure I belong, in particular, here in Vermont. Christians can begin to feel, this is how it starts, we can begin to feel, and then we begin to talk, and then we begin to act like we're living in enemy territory. Like we're living in a state, in a place where we're surrounded by them. And I want to address that notion here at the end of this series. I want to zero in on that, that feeling that we can start to develop as Christians here in Vermont. This is the, the final point of this Love Vermont message. And I think, just to be honest with you, I think this might be the hardest pill for us to swallow. <laughs> Because here's my concern, and this is a concern that I have for myself, that where God looks with compassion, we begin to look with anger and fear. Where God, where, where, where we're looking and seeing the lost, we're beginning to see instead enemies. We begin to treat this place like we live in an enemy territory, like we're soldiers in a war zone, when God has planted us to be physicians in a hospital. So, church, uh, we're going to get into hard work this morning, internal work <laughs> this morning. It's a series that, that, that we've been exploring this notion of loving Vermont. It's, it's a series about taking our hearts out of Florida <laughs> or out of wherever you wish you lived instead and saying, no, God has planted me here. I live here. For whatever reason, he would have you invest and care for the people in this place now. And we've been on this journey, but finally we're looking at these practical examples, different individuals, the way the Lord has shaped these individuals, the way that God's love shapes people to become lovers of our neighbors, right? We looked at Caleb and Joshua two weeks ago and saw this bravery that the Lord can give us because loving people sometimes is scary, especially when they don't have to reciprocate it. So you're really putting yourself out there. And we learn from Caleb and Joshua, yes, we have to follow God, and it takes bravery. It takes surrendering fear. We learned last week from Jesus. Jesus himself we might still be very well as busy as ever, but if we follow him, we will be interruptible, right? Willing to stop what we're doing in order to show compassion or care. But the fly in the ointment, the unspoken difficulty in all of this series is that sometimes we feel like soldiers behind enemy lines. How are we supposed to love Vermont when so many Vermonters make it hard to love them? I hope I can say that and you don't think less of me. <laughs> um, I, I, and I mean that because I genuinely think it's like I genuinely think that's true. The more, the more people you interact with at work, particularly my work, the more people. I'm, that's a joke. I work at this church with you. Um, the more people you interact with at work, the more people you probably interact with at school, or, or, or maybe, just to hit home, the more people you interact with your family, right, who make this hard. What, what do we do about the angry people? The, what do we do about the atheists, the people who disagree and are disagreeable? What do we do about the people who have no interest in hearing of your faith, or maybe you're outright angry about it? We can be here in church talking about love in Vermont, and that's beautiful, but what do we do about the problem people? Right? I've been searching my heart over this for quite a while over the course of this series because I come here and we talk about, okay, I gotta love my neighbor, and then I go home and I talk to my neighbor and I think, oh. What I realized, I think, is this we don't need a message about how to deal with problematic people, we need a message about our problem with people. 
And our problem is not that people are bad. Our problem is that people are the easiest target. It's actually one of the first things the Bible teaches about. One of, one of the absolute first things we learn about humans in the Bible. This is the same fundamental logic that Adam ran to in the garden. So Adam and Eve, I think of the scriptures here, uh, Jason, from Genesis. Um, Adam and Eve eat the fruit. Not that one. Is there one before that or no? That's the one. Adam and Eve eat the fruit. They participate in that first act of disobedience. God's like, I told you one thing. There's one thing you can't do. And they did that thing, right? And then he confronts Adam, and he says, Adam, did you eat the fruit? I told, did you do the thing I told you not to do? Did you do that thing? And Adam says, what is his response? Somebody else. I mean, he does it twice. It's that woman that you gave me, right? Just look anywhere but me. It's the woman you gave me. You, we have this super highway in our brains that goes straight to this. It's, not, it's them. They're the problem. Somebody else is the enemy. Now, I'm going to say, sometimes people can be awful. Sometimes people are awful and mean and sinful. But as much as we want to stop people from being annoying or cruel or being conservatives or we want them to stop from being woke or want them to stop being Steelers fans, no progress. <laughs> no progress. No, you're not going to make any progress. I've, I've tried, but people really do like the Steelers. There is... There is sinfulness that pervades human nature. You're not going to be able to lecture it away. You're not going to be able to legislate it away. You're not going to be able to run from it. This is a broken and sin-poisoned world. It has been that since the second, third chapter of Genesis. It's that way here. It's that way in New Mexico. It's that way in Israel. It's that way in France. Our approach cannot just be pointing the finger at the outside world and telling God, I would be doing better if it wasn't for the people you put me with. I'd be better at my, loving my neighbor if you hadn't put me in such a bad neighborhood. It took Adam about half a second to look around and point the finger at the only other person who was there. We, it doesn't have to be taught. It's natural. It's so easy for us to just look at the culture or the society or some specific people around us and say, man, these people are the problem. But you and I know that doesn't move us into loving them. That's not a step towards compassion. That's not a step towards change. So what do we do then? What do we do about our problem with people? What do we do when it's so easy to look out the doors of this church and just get so frustrated or jaded? Our last example, our last historical figure in this series. This guy was led by the presence of God in his life in a way, I believe, that can teach you and me in this area. We're going to go to the Old Testament. Brent, why don't you come up and read our scripture for us? The Old Testament, 1 Samuel, we're going to be reading about David and Saul. So if you have your Bibles or devices and want to find your way to that scripture, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 24, we're going to read verses 2 through 7, as it is our tradition. If you're able, please stand out of reverence for God's word. God's word says this, 1 Samuel 24, starting in verse 2. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's choice man and went to look for David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. When Saul came to the sheep pens along the road, a cave was there, and he went in to relieve himself. David and his men were staying in the back of the cave, so they said to him, Look, this is the day the Lord told you about. He said, I will hand you your enemy over to you so you can do to him whatever you desire. Then David and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe, and he said to his man, I swear before the Lord, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. I will never lift my hand up against him since he is the Lord's anointed. With these words, David persuaded his man, 
and he did not let them rise up against Saul. This is God. You may be seated. All right. Will you join me? Let's pray over our time here. Father, thank you, as always, thank you for um, bringing this word here, for shepherding it through time and protecting it and, and bringing it here for us today. God, our desire always is that your will would be done in our time here, that, that you would have your way in this time. So, Father, as you've brought us this passage, I pray that you would speak through it to each of us as individuals. God, you know what is in our hearts. You know what, what's needed in our lives. And so, God, I pray that you would just, as each one of us here needs, that you would speak to us. Spirit, fill this place with your presence, with your compassion, your mercy, and even, yes, with your truth. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so a, an account of David. Uh, this, this moment when this guy, David, uh, is in kind of this strange limbo in his life. And it's the same David who killed the Goliath, if you're not familiar. Uh, he had that famous fight with a giant. Same David who wrote most of the Psalms in the Bible. If you read through the book of Psalms, a lot of them are attributed to this guy, David. Same guy. At this point in his story... David had been anointed, he had been kind of set aside to be the next king over Israel, over this nation of Israel. He had been set aside to be the king over Israel. That happened at 1 Samuel 16. But there was one problem with that, just one little, little problem, uh, which is that Israel already had a king, right? In fact... Israel had a king who had years ago been anointed by God also. Saul. Saul had been leading the nation of Israel for some time at this point. He had been the king. He had been ruling this nation. It was actually a position that God gave him. So Saul is, is the, the king at this, at this time. God actually chose Saul for this. He gave Saul a chance, gave him opportunities to succeed, to do well, and then it's just frankly like, you could read the whole story, but it doesn't work out. He had moments where he was doing pretty well, but then really he just ended up making all these just wrong decisions. And it ended up being very clear, he's not going to be able to lead Israel. He's not, he's not the guy. It comes to this point where it's clear he's not living up to whatever potential he had, and he's not the right guy for the job. So now David was God's choice to be next in line, to take over. But as you would imagine, Saul's not taking it well, Right? The news that God was moving on, that God's like, okay, it's time for the next person. That didn't, that didn't go over well for Saul. So Saul gathers up his army. He's still the king. He gathers up his army, and he begins to hunt down David in order to kill him, in order to stop David from taking the throne. Okay, you think you're going to take my throne from me? Well, i got other things coming for you, okay? So Saul gathers up his army. That's what's going on here in the scripture we just read. That's a story you're, you're kind of, we're just jumping into the middle of. So think about these two characters that were represented here that we just read. You have, on the one hand, David. David is the guy here who's in relationship with God. David is, the, he's being hunted, actively hunted. He's being betrayed. He's being prevented in this time from stepping forward into what God has for him in his life. He's actually being uh, stopped from doing that. So he has every, you, you think about David's position, he has every right to be angry with Saul, Right? Not just to be angry, but I would say to be righteously angry at Saul. That's David. Because God has given him a plan. He's given him his purpose. He said, you're going to be the king. He's been anointed as the king. And he's being prevented from doing that by this guy, Saul. And then you have Saul, who's blinded by rage. He's probably full of shame and fear and anger. He's motivated by a desire to hold on to his power, no matter what the consequences. So he's commanding an army to chase this guy down and to kill him. And all that comes to a head here in this moment that we read in this cave. Saul leaves his army, this army that's hunting down David. He leaves his army at the mouth of a cave. Yes, this is in the Bible. 
He goes in to relieve himself. Typical man. The world is his outhouse. It just so happens, good or bad luck, David and his friends are hiding in that same cave. Although, to be fair, they probably should have seen it coming. They actually uncovered this cave, archaeological uh, find of this cave. I have a picture of it. They should have seen this coming. <laughs> this is my first exploration into chat GPT, asking it to create a cave with a toilet in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. David and his guys are hiding. Take that away, Jason. <laughs> David and his guys are hiding in this cave. Okay. I mean, they're being hunted, right? So they're they're seeking refuge. They're they're hiding in a cave, which seems like a pretty good hiding place. In the dark, can't see him, right? Saul wanders in. All by himself. No bodyguards. No army around him to protect him. Just. They're vulnerable, not knowing that the people he is hunting are in the cave with him. They're hidden. He has no idea they're there. It's dramatic. It's dramatic because David is in the middle of a people problem. Right? Specifically, this obstacle in his life, the problem in David's life, is all comes down to this person. Saul. So much of any difficulty David was experiencing was because of Saul's anger and bitterness and power. The reason David wasn't able to follow God's plans, Saul. Like if we had asked Adam, if Adam had been there in David's place, and we were to say, Adam, what's wrong here? What's the problem here? Adam would be like, that guy, right? (laughs) Saul, he's the problem. It's this king you gave me. (laughs) From David's, okay, so from David's side of the story, everything here suggests this guy is the issue. This guy is what's wrong. He was the problem that needed solving. He was the thing. David was meant to become king. Saul was in the way of that. David wanted to stay alive. Saul had other plans. David is enjoying a time in a cave with his friends. Saul's going to stink the place up, okay? You get the picture. David had every reason seriously, to despise this guy, right? To defeat him, maybe humiliate him, make him a laughingstock. David had reason to think of Saul as his enemy, as his adversary. And what do you do when you have your enemy right where you want him? You, You defeat them. But then you see how David responded. He responds with a different perspective, doesn't he? Who am I, David says, to move against the Lord's anointed. This incredible thing here that I see, David didn't see Saul the way everybody else saw Saul, as a problem. He saw Saul from this different perspective. David chose God's perspective. And God's perspective is that Saul is somehow precious and important. (laughs) That Saul had at one point been the best option uh, for this nation. As much as a problem Saul was to David, David chose patience and peace based on how God saw him. I know how I feel about him, but I trust God how you feel about him more. Look at it. He reminds his soldiers of this. You want me to strike Saul? How, David says, can I strike the Lord's anointed? Who was Saul to David in that moment? An adversary, an enemy. But how does David describe him? Not as who Saul was to him, but who Saul is to God. Who am I to strike? Not my enemy. Who am I to strike God's anointed one? As much as you and I might have problems with people, with family, with co-workers, I bet David had more of a reason to hold a grudge against Saul than you do. But here it says, who am I to look at somebody and value my opinion more than God's? His problem was not solved by removing Saul from the picture. As natural as an action that would have been, 
instead of following the pattern of Adam that you and I talked about, David is transformed by God's perspective. And that can, I mean, you can see where this is going because that conclusion, <laughs> the more you think about it, the less you're going to like it. More often than not, our problems with people don't have to do with their ability to hurt us. It has to do with our inability to see people from the right perspective. More often than not, our problem with people is not because of what they do, but because of what we fail to do. Because we fail to see them through the eyes of a loving and merciful and patient God. If people are your problem, the, the solution, believe it or not, is perspective. And I, it's like, I get, like, I understand what I'm saying here. I know it's pretty radical, and I also know it's not satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you don't even want this change. I think most people don't actually want this change. <laughs> What's that thing we say? I, I want mercy for me, but I want justice for everybody else. <laughs> most, of the, most of us don't want this kind of change. But I believe God can open our eyes to see people the way he wants us to see them. Where people are no longer problems, but precious. <laughs> if we were to learn a lesson from David here and apply it to where we live in Vermont, this is a state maybe that feels like it's full of adversaries, full of doubters, full of people who don't respect your beliefs. You may see all this, and you might have every right to feel this way. This is not a state full of Christ followers. It's a state full of all kinds of different people making all kinds of questionable and sometimes really terrible moves. And yet, you do not live in enemy territory. You live in a state full of people for whom God has immeasurable compassion. This is a state full of people for whom God's heart breaks. Full of people for whom Jesus died. Did you think he only loves people who vote like you? Eugene Peterson suggested we look at it this way. He said, people are not problems to be fixed, but mysteries to be honored and revered. Maybe the answer to our people problem is to let God start to reveal that mystery. The mystery of the innate dignity and the God-given dignity and value and beauty of people. Jesus says, I came not for the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. Peter tells us that God wants all to come to repentance. His desire is not to condemn the world, Jesus' own world, words, but to save it. If we're transformed by a relationship with Jesus to see others, not from our perspective, but from the Lord's perspective, we will become lovers of our neighbors in the most incredible and fruitful way. I want to tell you, with, with her permission, about my friend Sherry. Um, she's shared her story before, but I, I just I want to reiterate it. Sherry had experienced a life of pain and struggling, stemming back to all kinds of different abuse she suffered as a girl. The abuse resulted in her feeling distrustful of men her entire life. It resulted in confusion about her own, her own identity, about how she even thought about herself. It resulted in a lifetime of searching for connect and connection, searching for peace and not finding it. A lifetime of this. I met Sherry in her late 70s when she wandered into this church. And she was, I believe, I'm quoting exactly, defensive and abrasive. <laughs> and you guys, you got to hear this. By this time in her life, she had many, many experiences with people who wanted to show her the error of her ways. Familiar with religion. She knew all the, I, I tried them, she knew all the arguments. 
She knew what it was like, in other words, for somebody to point the finger at her and say, you are the problem. You are what needs to be solved. You are what's broken. And then something, daybreak, something happened. She came into this church. And to you people. And you dared to welcome her as she was. Sherry wandered into a place where nobody tried to fix her. Where nobody tried to scare her straight. Nobody told her that people like her were the problem. People just listened. You people made sure she was seen. Acknowledge her dignity as a human. It was beautiful. And I'll tell you what, today, God love her. Sherry is still abrasive and gruff. (laughs) But the love she experienced has revolutionized her from the inside out. And it's because people saw her from God's perspective as a precious daughter. But this miracle that changed her life, is not it wasn't shame and, and guilt, it was mercy and love. It was the love shown by God's people that eventually led her to the throne of Jesus herself, where she was baptized here in this room, confessing her faith in Jesus as Lord. Many of us got a chance to witness that. This is a citizen of heaven now. Because God moved in this church. This is what happens when we take a step away from Adam's perspective and say, this person is a problem. And we step into God's and say, this person is a child. So, Christians, maybe we move on from pointing the finger at others. Perhaps it's time... I'm talking to you and I'm talking to me here. Perhaps it's time to move on from listing what's broken about this state. Perhaps it's time to move on from listing what's broken about some of the people here. Perhaps it's time to move on from what's broken and instead mirror the love of the one that heals. Let's get the worship team to come back up here and lead us in our response as they think you, as they do, maybe this is a calling out for you and for me. I can't think of a simpler way to put it than to say we got to stop seeing people the way Adam did and start seeing them the way God does. Let's pray. Father, again, we are... Uh, confronted by the truth of your word, maybe by the simplicity of it, but also, God, by uh, just the, uh, the way it takes no prisoners. So, Father, I do pray for our hearts now that, um, that we would step away from, uh, from rage, that we would step away from condemnation, that we would step away from anger, and God, that we would let our hearts and even maybe our eyes be transformed by your love. In Jesus' name.